car chases. They make for some of the most memorable moments in movies, from old school muscle to absolute mayhem. The ultra gritty to, well, but whatever the chase, one thing is for sure. They're expensive. But what if they didn't have to be? What if instead of going big, you went small? So the mission was simple. Create a cool car chase sequence with scale model cars. The idea being that I could avoid the permits, the insurance forms, and the tens of thousands of dollars that come along with shooting a large scale Hollywood chase. So let's go toy shopping. And this is where we, we run into our first little problem. What we've effectively done by going small is left the complicated Hollywood car chase traditions behind and entered the staggering world of miniature filmmaking. One that comes with its own complex set of rules. First one being go big, which kind of sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Most miniatures in movies aren't as small as you think. The miniature Seven Mile Bridge in True Lies was over 100 meters long, and the miniature Batmobile in The Dark Knight was still one third the scale of the real thing. But why? Surely it's more cost effective to go smaller. I mean, it's not called bigature, is it? Well, it has to do with the things you can't control. One of the main reasons why Stetson Visual Services built the miniature bridge in True Lies so big was the water. If they went too small, the waves splashing around it would have looked huge. It's also the main reason why I can't use a real road to shoot this chase. At miniature scale, the tiny rocks that make up the bitumen are more like boulders, making the car bounce around like it's on the worst road to ever exist. Going bigger also means more room for more detail, which is especially true if you want to get closer to the model, which we definitely do. So this is too, too small. Better. The only problem is I need to be able to articulate the car's front wheels, which I can't with these cars. And if I can't turn the wheels, it's going to be pretty hard for me to make a believable car chase. So after a little bit of research, the choice became obvious. RC cars. Not only are some of these models insanely realistic, but they're designed to be driven by a remote control, go figure. Which means proper steering and the ability to spin the wheels remotely. So after falling deep into the world of RC cars, I think I found the two that could work perfectly. They're also the cheapest. A silver 1969 El Camino and a purple 2015 Dodge Challenger, both 10th scale. Now I did say cheapest and not cheap because the El Camino is $330 and the Challenger is $379. But the beauty of these is that they have proper lighting hardware, which should help sell them as full size, especially if we set the chase at night. So we make the expensive purchase and we wait. Now these things are huge, which is great. This detail is exactly what we need for this chase, but forget that for a second, okay? Let's see how fast these babies go, okay? I mean, that, that is a lot slower than I thought they'd be. So taking the shell off, the base. Turns out these $350 RC cars don't come with batteries included. So $70 later, we're finally in business. And holy cow, are these things fast. Almost too fast. Like they are incredibly touchy, which has me slightly worried.
Anyway, let's install these lights, which also didn't come with the cars, but they are only 20 bucks, so it's all good. And after connecting them to the battery and installing them into the, into the little housings, man, was that $20 worth every cent. I mean, look at this. Look, look at it. They make such a difference to the car's perceptive scale. They look full size, especially with the lights off. So we're looking good, but we've got another problem. Because we're no longer working with Hot Wheels anymore, the set for this chase is going to have to be huge. And if you can't tell, I have no idea what I'm doing. These miniature sets take a whole crew of miniature masters months, not to mention tons of material and money. So what are we gonna do? Well, have no fear, for I have an idea. A filmmaking technique almost as old as the medium itself. Reprojection involves projecting an image through a screen that sits behind your subject to place your scene somewhere that might be too difficult to shoot on location. But there's also front projection. Instead of projecting the image through the screen towards the camera, the projector is placed on the same side as the camera, more akin to how you would traditionally use a projector. It's the exact method Stanley Kubrick used to create the iconic shots in the opening sequence from 2001, A Space Odyssey. And if it's good enough for Stanley, well, it's good enough for me. The problem I'm having is that I've got two filmmaking techniques basically butting heads with each other. The front projection, which works best with the least amount of ambient light possible. That's at complete odds with my attempts to light the miniature in front of it, which needs tons and tons of light to make it work. But why is that? Why do I need so much light? So the concept of miniature filmmaking is simple. Film something at a smaller scale and suddenly you can do things that would never have been possible otherwise, like blowing up the White House in camera or recreating the world of Harry Potter in excruciating detail in camera. But the main issue with this filmmaking technique is your camera. Because it doesn't shrink with your model, you run into a significant problem. If I want to shoot my life-size car, I have to stand here, about two meters away, if I want to get all of it in frame. But to replicate a shot like that with our 10th scale El Camino, I have to put the camera here, which is more like 20 centimeters away. And if you attempt to focus on something this close to the lens, you end up with something that looks a little like this, where the depth of field is incredibly shallow. And this shallow depth of field is a dead giveaway that what you're shooting is small thanks to how our eyes interpret these defocus cues. It's why this shot from the social network and this shot from game night feel small. It's this artificially shallow depth of field they've added in posts that tricks your brain. See, normal sized people, tiny sized people. Now I could just stop down the aperture on the camera to solve the broker issue, but then everything's too dark. So I think we need to figure out another way. Does anyone remember when Jon Favreau created a character that basically wore a large spherical mirror as a helmet, so ILM had to reinvent the very concept of visual effects compositing because any green screens on set would have just shown up in the reflection of the helmet, and now we have the LED volume that's been used in countless films and TV shows like 1899, The Fablemans, and The Batman? Well, let's do that. Not the Jon Favreau bit, the LED volume thing. And if you didn't get any of that, we're basically going to move the world around the RC cars instead of the RC cars moving themselves. It's kind of like the front projection concept, but better. 
So although a little more quaint than ILM's setup, I've got the LED TV part sorted. Oh, it looks like he's added a mini drive-in. But I still need actual background plates to display on the TV. And when I say background plates, I mean all this, which is being rendered live and in real time by a computer. ILM's Stagecraft volume uses Unreal Engine, which just so happens to be free, which is great. Only problem is I don't have a computer anywhere near powerful enough to recreate those backgrounds in real time. Okay, that's working. Oh, no, okay. But then I remember the Matrix Resurrections. No, nope, not the movie, the demo. So after you play through this awesome interactive car chase, the demo opens up and allows you to explore the city, which is where the demo basically becomes a city sized set. You've got sliders for traffic, for parked cars, pedestrians, even the time of day, not to mention genuine camera settings. But to make this whole thing work, I need to figure out a way to make the road beneath the car appear to be moving as well. Well, hello, old friend. If I set up the projector above the action and project a moving plate of a road down onto the panel the car is sitting on, I could potentially simulate movement and hopefully once the lights are off, it could look pretty convincing. So after propping up the cars so I can get the wheels spinning without creating a car-shaped hole in the wall, it was time to do some tests. That is effectively a moving jib shot on a Ukraine shot entirely in my garage with, a, with an RC car. So after doing some more tests and figuring out how to properly combine the road and the background, as well as working out a rough shot listed sequence, it was time to head into the matrix demo and shoot this damn car chase. When you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go downtown. When you've got worries, all the noise and the hurry seems to help, I know. Downtown, just listen to the music of the traffic in the city. Linger on the sidewalk where the neon signs are pretty. How can you lose the light so much brighter there? You can't forget all your troubles, forget all your cares, so go downtown. Things will be great when you're downtown. No final place for sure, downtown. Everything's waiting for you. So, after weeks of shooting and reshooting, 
I'd got the shots I needed with the RC cars. Now it was time for the close-ups of the drivers. And when I say drivers, I mean me and me with a moustache. And once again, the projector comes in clutch. Using some out of focus shots I took of our one of our street lights and our porch light, I created a randomized lighting pattern that could play over me to simulate the car moving under street lights. Originally, I had also planned to use the TV as a background plate, but we soon discovered that it would genuinely have taken forever to line up the perspective and time everything perfectly for each moment of the chase. So we decided to scrap it. The following night, we ended up changing the angle slightly and just going with the projector and a smart bulb for a, a rim light to add a bit of depth to me, resulting in this. So pretty happy with how it was looking. We got shooting. Now, I'd been editing as I shot, but now that I had everything I needed, it was time to properly start putting it all together. And that not only meant the cut, but the sound as well, which was going to have to do some pretty heavy lifting to bring this sequence together in a meaningful way. And one key element of sound is music. And if you know me well enough, well, you know exactly where I'm getting that music from. Okay, so I want something that has a bit of momentum, some tension and some cinematic qualities that will help kind of elevate the whole sequence. So using their filtered search engine, I was able to find three songs that should work perfectly. Now you can use their playlists that curate their 40,000 plus song library um, to help you find exactly what you're looking for. But either way, you have a ton of options. Like I said, I've been using Musicbed for the better part of four years and I still can't get over the amount of quality songs you get from top shelf artists for the price. If I had music bed when I was like a little young and making really cringy short films with my friends, I, I, I honestly do not know what I would have done with myself. Um, so if you're curious and you don't have a subscription, you're more than welcome to use my code, PaulET, to get some discount if you purchase an annual subscription. So massive thanks to music bed for sponsoring this video. Shooting a car chase is tough, but what's just as hard is crafting proper sound effects for each car. Every gear change, every collision, every tire screech. Now you can purchase car sound effects packs, but some of the better ones cost close to 1800 Australian and the cheaper ones just aren't robust enough for a car chase sequence. There's also no feasible way I could record the sounds myself at a Hollywood level. For example, when we recorded the truck, we had, we, we had the truck they used on location and we had 18 microphones on that truck and put it through all kinds of paces. And then when mixing the scene, we were able to mix between these different mics that were picking up different details, whether it was the turbo exhaust or the creaks in the bed or the interior or the engine mics. There was a great sonic palette to work from. We purchased six cars and completely totaled them. Yeah. yeah. But I do have a potential solution. Why did I move here? I guess it was the weather. The so the idea essentially would be to pick two cars from GTA 5 that resemble our El Camino and Challenger and then record their engines for specific moments in the chase. So many burnouts later, I realized just how expertly mixed Rockstar's car engine sounds are. It's hard enough to mix sounds for an exclusively one-way medium like film. So I can't imagine how utterly complex it would be to do that for a completely interactive medium like video games. Now, originally I was gonna use the Cheval Picardo, which is Rockstar's version of the El Camino, but it just wasn't fast enough. So I ended up using the Vapid Dominator for the El Camino's engine and the Bravado Gauntlet for the Challenger. So editing and mixing the sound together ended up being one of the most challenging aspects of this whole project. Who would have thought that if you just cut between two car engines for the whole chase, it would sound super annoying. But after many hours of messing with EQs and reverb and panning to, to kind of spice things up, I ended up with something that sounded 
kind of good. Also, just a side note, um, I probably wouldn't do the whole recording sounds from GTA 5 thing for your film, um, as although this is kind of okay within an analytical context, just a short film with a car chase isn't. Unless you're, you're doing it for fun. Or don't listen to me. Whatever. I, I mean, I can't tell you what to do. Anyway, after two months of trial and error, two TVs, two RC cars, batteries not included, and some help from friends and family. I'm blowing to that! <laughs> the chase was done. Was it worth all that time and money? Um, I'll let you decide. <laughs>